Oh, my dear, my very dear Wormwood, how mistakenly, now that all is lost, you come whimpering to ask whether the terms of affection in which I addressed you were false from the very beginning. Far from it. My love for you and your love for me are like two peas. I have always desired you, just as you, pitiful fool, have always desired me. The difference is that I am the stronger. I think they will give you to me now, or at least a bit of you. <sighs> Why, love you? Yes, I do. As dainty a morsel as ever I grew fat on. You have let a soul slip through your fingers. The howl of sharpened famine for that loss re-echoes at this very moment down through all the levels of the Kingdom of Noise to the very throne itself. It makes me mad to think of it. How well I know what happened at the moment they snatched him from you. There was a sudden clearing of his eyes, was there not, as he saw you for the first time, and knew what part you had had in him, and knew that you had it no longer. Just think, and let it be the beginning of your agony, what he felt in that moment. As though a scab had fallen from an old sore, as though he was emerging from a disgusting shell-like tetter as though he was finally shrugging off an old garment for the last time. By hell, it is misery enough to see them in their mortal days, taking off dirty and uncomfortable clothes and splashing about in hot water, making little pig-like grunting noises. What of this, this final stripping, the complete cleansing? The more one thinks of it, the worse it becomes. He got through so easily. No gradual misgivings, no doctor's visits, no nursing homes, no operating theater, no false hopes for life. Just sheer, instantaneous liberation. One moment it seemed to be all our world. The scream of terror, the fall of bodies, the stink and taste of gas on the lips and in the lungs, the burning of the feet, the aching of the legs, the reeling of the mind. The next moment, all this was gone. Gone like a bad dream. Defeated, outmaneuvered fool! Did you mark how naturally, as if he'd been born for it, the earthborn vermin entered the new life? How all his doubts became instantaneously ridiculous? I know just what the creature was saying to itself. Oh, yes, of course, it was always like this. The horrors all follow the same course. They get worse and worse until you hit the bottleneck and you feel that you are almost to be crushed. And then behold, all is well. The extraction hurt worse and worse, and then the tooth was out. The dream became a nightmare, and then you woke. You die and die, and then you are beyond death. How could I ever have doubted it? As he saw you, he also saw them. I know how it was. You reeled back, dizzy and blinded, more hurt by them than he had ever been by the bullet. The degradation of it, that this thing of earth and slime could stand upright and converse with spirits before whom you, a spirit, could only cower. Perhaps you had hoped that the awe and strangeness of it would dash his joy, but that is the cursed thing. The gods do look strange to the mortal eye, and yet not strange. Before that hour he had never even imagined what they would look like, and even doubted their existence. And yet, as soon as he saw them, he knew that he had always known them, and knew what part they had played at many an hour in his life when he had thought himself alone, so that when he finally met them he could say not, who are you, but rather, ah, it was you the whole time. All they were and said at this meeting woke memories. That dim sense of friends about him in his solitude since infancy was now explained. The central music of every pure experience that had always just barely escaped memory was now recovered. The recognition made him free of their company before the limbs of his corpse were quiet. Only you were left outside. He not only saw them, he saw him. This thing, this animal, this creature begotten in a bed could look on him. What is blinding, suffocating fire to you is now cool light to him, is clarity itself. And where's the form of a man? You would like, if you could, to interpret the patient's prostration in the presence, his self-abhorrence and a complete knowledge of his sins, yes, an even more complete knowledge than yours, as some sort of analogy with the choking, suffocating sensation which you feel whenever you encounter that deadly air which breathes from the heart of heaven. But it's all nonsense. Pains he may still have to encounter, but they embrace those pains. He would not trade them for any earthly pleasure. 
all the delights of sense or heart or intellect with which you would have once tempted him, even the delights of virtue itself are in comparison as the half-nauseous attractions of a worn-out harlot would seem to a man who hears that his beloved, whom he has loved all his life and believed was dead, is now at his door. He is caught up to that world where pain and pleasure take on transfinite values, and all our arithmetic is dismayed. Once more, the inexplicable meets us. Next to the curse of useless tempters like yourself, our next greatest curse is the failure of our intelligence department. If only we could find out what he is really up to. Alas, that knowledge, in itself so hateful and sickening a thing, should be necessary for power. Sometimes I am almost in despair. All that sustains me is my conviction that our realism, our rejection in the face of all temptations, of all silliness and tricks, in the end must win. <sighs> Meanwhile, I have you to settle with. I am, and for a short while more, continue to be your increasingly and ravenously affectionate uncle.